Well, I've got 9.05, so I'm going to start. Um, our slides will be up there. You have a copy of the handout. It's not really big because this is going to be probably a lot more of chatting about questions. Handouts? Yeah. By the door where the sign-in sheet is? Thank you. you betcha. You betcha. So I'll start with um, a little bit about me. My name is Amy Benish. I'm the Community Relations Liaison for the Department of Revenue. I go around talking to people about tax stuff, all tax stuff. Like right now, I'm talking to accountants about the new tax forms for individual income and corporate income tax. Um, stay up on all that. Um, withholding tax in Arizona is fairly simple, so, but I know all about withholding tax. Um, tax licensing, I've uh, got a lot of experience in tax licensing, bonds, and my favorite part of tax is transaction privilege tax. I'm just geeky like that, and so I like to think about the different classifications, the different tax types, stuff like that. Most recently, I was up here talking to contractors about the change in contracting tax, so, um, so that's what I talk about. I've been at the Department of Revenue 22 years. <coughs> When you work for a state agency, frequently uh, you will do other jobs other than your own as people leave or, in my case, because you want to know how things work. So I have been a field enforcement officer at one time. Uh, I've been, in addition to uh, being out and teaching and stuff, I've been a licensing uh, supervisor and manager. I was an internal training manager for one of our divisions. So, uh, oh, and I've done a lot of training with the processing people, so I can tell you all sorts of things about when you send us a return and a payment, how that works. Um, I've even cashiered payments at our front counter, so I know uh, basically what comes in and what it looks like and what we do with it, all that kind of stuff. Any question that you have, just stop and give me a hey, Amy, and I'll answer. Along with answering, I uh, give out my phone number that rings directly on my desk. I am notorious for answering the phone all the time when I'm sitting there. If I'm out teaching somewhere, when I get back, I answer every voicemail that I got, including during the heat of the contracting stuff last March and April when I would get 100 calls a day. Still answered every single one of them. Emails, I do the same. So my phone number, 602-716-716. 6037. My email, A, and then it's B, E, N, E, S, C, H, at A, Z, D, O, R, dot gov. That's the secret to how to email people at the Department of Revenue usually, first initial, last name, shh. Um, I answer emails too. If I read your question, and, and don't be shocked if, I, if you send me an email and three seconds later I call you, because if I'm at my desk and I read it, I will. But uh, if I read your question and I can tell that you and I are going to go back and forth, like I'm going to ask you a question, you're going to ask me a question, I'm just going to send you something that says, you know what, this looks a little more complex than email, call me. I'm at my desk and I'll tell you when I'm going to be at my desk and I'll answer the phone if nobody else is on my other line because that's what I do. If it's something that I can send you an answer to, I'll not only send you the answer, but I'll send you where I found it so you have it in writing and you can print it out, like links on our website and stuff. That's where I find most of the information. And I navigate our website like crazy, so I've got that. I have videos um, for transaction privilege tax for contractors out, and I gave up my phone number and my email address on those too. And I get phone calls and emails from those as well. I still answer them. So don't be shocked if you get an answer. I know sometimes people are like, oh, well, I don't know. I call and nobody gets back to me. Me, I, I get back to people. Okay? So now you've got that. Um, we'll start with the first slide. Welcome, City of Sedona, back to the Arizona Department of Revenue TPT collection. You guys were with RDS. Uh, your contract started in, like, 2010 and uh, ran all the way through this year. There was some legislation uh, that came about in prior years that said that uh, cities could not have a third party collecting entity for their tax anymore, and so contracts couldn't be renewed. You guys are going to come back to being a program city with the Department of Revenue. Um, some cities came back last year because their contracts 
ended at the beginning of last year. You guys are coming back now. And the cities that collect their own tax will be back with us sometime during 2016 as well. It's part of transaction privilege tax simplification, trying to make it easy so you guys have one return, one entity that you have to deal with. That's it. Um, uh, I got calls from people that worked for RDS to ask me tax questions because you guys were trying to ask them questions and they just plainly didn't know. Finding out some of the people from RDS was pretty easy. They all had southern accents because apparently they're in the south somewhere. And they couldn't pronounce any of the names of the cities here in Arizona. One guy told me he wanted to know something about Fort Huahuca. I was like, you ain't from around these parts. He meant Huachuca. <laughs> but that just cracked me up, Huahuca. I was like, all righty then. And even Sedona, I had some weird pronunciations. They would tell me people were from Sedona or Sedona or Sedona, which I thought was funny because I think everybody all over the world knows Sedona. I know people in uh, the Pacific do. I was um, over there for a while and I had people ask me about the red rocks and are they really red and stuff like that. And is it really that beautiful? And my answer always is, uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. So welcome back. We're going to do the best that we can to serve you guys. How um, many of you have had tax licenses prior to 2010? most of you. So you remember the TPT1 return and filling it in and sending stuff to us? There have been some changes, so we'll talk about the changes and I'll talk about some coming changes as well. And then um, if it's somebody who's going to start a new business, I'll talk about licensing changes and stuff like that. Could you, um, I'll start over here with this gentleman, could you tell me what industry or business classification you work in? Contracting. I figured. Service. Yeah, okay, contracting and service. Janitorium company is still mm -hmm. Contracting service. <laughs> that contracting is still popular. You're a contractor, I know yeah. that. And you? <clears throat> CPA. Oh, well. You're not taxable. Go ahead and go. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. And you two are from the city? Yeah, I'm Martha. Oh, hi, Martha. Marcia, hi. Oh, hi. Marcia. Martha and Marsha. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> yeah, like you never hear that. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'll talk about some generalities for the contractors in the room that have contracting questions. Feel free to ask questions. I'll answer those. This isn't necessarily directed toward contracting, but we've got all the way till noon, and I'll answer questions. Yes? I have a question on adding the city of Sedona. Uh -huh. You sent us a, a form that says we don't need to reapply this right? year, mm -hmm. but with the addition to the city, do we have to send in a form? to add the city to our, to so our file. So are you already doing work in the city of Sedona? Mm -hmm. And are you already licensed with the city of Sedona? Right. Okay. So we're going to kind of cover this in renewals, but I'll cover it now because you ask. The answer is if you're already licensed with Sedona and you already have a state tax license, no, you don't have to add Sedona. Uh, Sedona probably already exists for you in our world um, and just is masked because when you guys left, and went to RDS, that didn't mean we obliterated it, we just quit printing it. Um, and additionally, the city is giving us a list of their known stuff, Great. and so that's going to kind of go on there. And we're trying to make it as easy and not having to fool around as possible for everybody. Thank In you. fact, our renewal letter that came out, since he's asked about it, says, if there's no changes, you don't have to do anything. Okay? All right, so we'll get underway. As I was saying, this city of Sedona, and this is on your first slide with a lot of words other than the welcome, city of Sedona is returning to the state collection uh, process and system starting January 1st, 2016. Originally, every city was supposed to come back to us January 1st, 2016 uh, as part of a really collaborative effort between the cities that collect their own tax or non-program cities and uh, the state to through legislation that was passed to make it so you guys really have one tax entity you have to deal with, one answer, one everything. A lot of stuff has fallen in line, uh, but there's a lot of moving parts. Sedona's coming back because RDS's contract is up with the city. Uh, Flagstaff will be back with us sometime during 2016. It was supposed to be uh, really the first of 2015, but there was a, a little bit of a change that the cities wanted in programming uh, for um, some types of businesses where it would be location-based 
uh, reporting because some cities had that. Uh, it will be location-based reporting eventually, but we're going to run location-based reporting for a period of time so that all the cities can see how it flows and works and approve. Um, we have cities like Tucson, Flagstaff, Phoenix, Avondale, all those coming back. And so getting everybody to test and look at it and have comments and then work on the comments and have everybody test it again has been kind of a long process because some people are far away and the only place they can test it is through the Department of Revenue's office because we don't have people remotely sign on. That would be bad. So um, that's taking a little longer, but we want to make sure everybody's real secure with it. So you guys are coming back now. If you do work in Flagstaff, any of you guys do work in Flagstaff? Yeah. If you do work in Flagstaff, you continue to uh, renew your license up there and report with them. Randy or Ram Chima is in charge up there. Um, you'll continue to report through them until we get to a point where we say, okay, everything's good, and we flip the switch and it comes over. It'll be like driving on the freeway. Uh, anywhere, you'll have a warning that says in 10 miles it's going to happen, and then a five miles, and then two miles, and then the sign that says, and it's happening. So uh, you'll have plenty of warning to get in the lane and how it's going to be. Um, we'll be sending out lots of information in a variety of ways, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But you'll know when it's coming, okay? Um, the rates for January, uh, we don't predict any changes. Um, your first return in January will be for December, and December still is with RDS. Your first return that you'll send to the Department of Revenue will be in February. It'll be your January return because you're always a month behind. It'll be in February on the TPT-1, which is that pink form. If you're filing and reporting online, you'll do it online. The rates uh, will be posted on our January rate table. There's a, a rate table available to businesses, but I brought you a preview of it. You'll also have this coming out in your stuffer that'll come out uh, this month or next month for uh, showing what's coming. And this is something I want to point out to you that has changed. When you were with us before, cities had different um, business codes than the state had. And so if you didn't have a specific business code that had a different tax rate, most cities had everybody reporting under zero, zero, zero. So you would be 015 if you were a contractor for the state, but on the city line, zero, zero, zero. Or 017 for a retailer and on the city line, zero, zero, zero. Now, in order to make it simpler, everything is going to have the same business code. So you look down the list of things that you are for retail. Your region code will be SE for Sedona. Your business code will be 017 for retail. And your state rate will be also reflected under 017. It just makes it easier overall. Um, for the ones that didn't have separate rates, it was kind of easy because you guys were 000. But one of the things we discovered is the cities that collect their own tax had actually assigned odd uh, business codes in places. Like you would be a contractor of 015, but you'd be 010, which was actually a different business class job printing. So that was a little weird. So that's a change that you'll notice. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me the difference between e-tax purchases and e-tax certification? Yep. Um, her question is, what's the difference between business class 029 and business class 030? Now, use tax has been around for as long as transaction privilege tax has been around. Um, it is set up to kind of even the ground, make the playing field even for um, everybody. If somebody purchases something from outside the state and has it shipped into them, and that business they buy it from doesn't have nexus with the state of Arizona, in other words, they don't have a reason to charge Arizona tax. Um, they don't have a business location here. They don't have a warehouse here. They don't have an employee or a contracted employee here for as little as two days a year. Then they don't have an obligation to charge you Arizona tax. That doesn't mean that you get a, an 8% discount. It means when you get it into you, you're supposed to pay tax. So that's what 029 is. Okay? You bought it somewhere else. If you'd have bought it in the state, you'd have had transaction privilege tax. Just the fact that you bought it somewhere else means you didn't. Now when you get it here, you have to pay it. For businesses, it goes on your TPT return. 
for individuals, and yes, as individuals, this holds up as well, for individuals, um, you may recall in 2010 there was a line on your income tax return. Everybody was like, ah, new tax, new tax. It isn't new. We were just giving you a new way to tell us about it. But for individuals, if you buy something, you're supposed to, above $500, you're supposed to pay tax. So um, that's one of the things. We have people who regularly pay tax under 029. Um, if you buy a car or a boat outside the state of Arizona, before you can register it for use in Arizona, if you go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, they assess you a tax, and uh, it's an 029. And if you go to Game and Fish to license a boat, they'll say you need to pay the Department of Revenue, and they'll give you information on how to do it. So that's 029. 030 is you bought it using your tax license and put it in your inventory, and now you're consuming it. And I'll give you an example. Um, I own uh, a carpet store. I sell carpet. And so I buy my carpet from an out-of-state mill that ships it to me. They don't have any reason to charge Arizona tax at all. And I put it in my inventory. I now decide that I want to use the carpeting in my office to make my office look better. My carpet's worn out. I'm not going to go buy carpet from some other competition. I'm going to take carpet out of my own stock and put it down. In fact, I'm going to tell people, look how well it's wearing. This is what I sell. You know, it's a selling point. I'm now the consumer of it. That's 030. I've taken it out of my inventory. I'm now using it. I have to pay tax. OK? So if you've been using the wrong one, do we just switch to the right one? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> you can. Um, so the, basically, it's out of state versus in state. Yes, yes. And if you uh, look on our website, we have a publication for use tax, mm -hmm. and that is pretty much how it defines okay. it. Yep. Um, the correct answer is you should probably go back and actually, for correctness, amend the returns you did it wrong on. However, I'm going to tell you it makes a net taxable difference of not much. Okay. So, zero, yeah, <laughs> really. And if you reported properly, not a big deal. So I would not make that a huge priority. Just a, hey, I'm really bored. I have nothing else to do kind of day. No, yeah, you know, me neither. Okay. <laughs> and you had a question? So the consumer would buy the sample buying the carpet. What if you're buying that carpet specifically for a client to install? It's not inventory. You see what I'm saying? It comes mm, into my store. No. I just came in and bought it. Um, would that be considered inventory when it's bought purposely for that? You're market? in the business of selling carpeting? No, my business is tile. Okay. I buy tile. Right, so you're in the business of buying and selling floor coverings. Correct. Okay, so cash and carry for that, the guy's going to take it and do it himself? That's retail. No, uh, I do the installation. Right, so if you're doing the installation, you need to follow the rules for contracting. Right, which is normally what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But with the changes, No, you, my materials. you may need to pay tax up front for your materials. We'll talk about that when okay. we get to the contracting part. Okay. Have you looked at any of the contracting materials on the website? I have a couple of your tutorials. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm just clarifying since I'm yeah. going to come and make sure. If you're somebody who's doing MURA work, and since we have a bunch of contractors, I'll talk about it just real quick here. If you're doing MURA work, you should pay tax when you're purchasing in order to install the carpet. Okay, in a Murrah job, like this carpet is worn out, you're going to replace it, that's a replacement, that's a Murrah. So you should pay tax on it. If you're ordering it from a carpet mill out of state and they have no reason to charge you tax, on your return, there's a line that you can put, not use tax, no, it's a retail equivalent, it's the 315 line. Okay, the reason it's not use tax is because not every city charges use tax, number one, so the city we didn't get the money. And number two, there's no county equivalent for use tax, no county excise tax, so it's already a lower rate. They want it to be the retail equivalent. So that 315 line is the retail equivalent. And if you look on the rate table, which is on our website, in the explanation of what uh, 315 is used for, it's for the Murrah materials on which you didn't pay a retail equivalent of tax that are being incorporated into a Murrah job. Okay. okay, now the deal with that is 
you pay the tax on it. If, if they don't charge you the tax up front, you pay the tax in the month that it's incorporated into the Murrah project. So here we are in the middle of December, okay? And so let's say you're doing the job today. That 315 line would be on your December return, okay? Maybe you invoice them at the end of the month and they pay you in January. Your 015 gross receipts goes on your January return. So it is possible that your materials need to be reported before your gross receipts. All right? Yeah, I try to make that really clear. Yep. So I'm not a contractor, but I have a question about cleaning contractors. Yep. So I guess I just, I want to explain to them when they would be taxable and when they would not be taxable. I right. I have a good way of doing that. I have a great way for you to do it. On our website, under TPT Simplification, mm -hmm. there is a, a tab for contracting. And the first thing on there is contracting FAQs. And so contracting FAQs talks about, uh, in question two, MURA, maintenance, repair, replacement, and alteration. For your painting contractors, the answer is going to be, are they the prime contractor first of all, working directly for the client? And if they are, then they determine if it's a MURA or not. Or are they coming as a subcontractor to somebody doing a greater job? And if that's the case, the prime is going to have to drive that for them. Because they might get there after all this other stuff is done and not know. I'm painting, but what am I painting? You know? All right, so that's the first dividing line. And then for maintenance, for painters, it might be like a little touch-up. Um, over by the door where the handles open up, nicks in the wall. I come in, I match the paint and touch it up. That's a MURA. Tax on the materials, no tax on the labor. The materials uh, that you pay tax on, what you pay for them plus the tax you pay for them plus any markup becomes the cost of the materials. You don't separately line item tax to the client for the materials. Okay, so that's the first part. Repair. Let's say you have a leak in the ceiling, okay? And the leak in the ceiling causes the ceiling tiles to buckle, and then it discolors this whole wall. So you have to, and maybe it even messes up the plaster. You have somebody come in, they replaster it, retape it, get it all texturized, and then you have a painter who comes to paint it. That's a repair. Again, part of Murrah. So same rules as the maintenance, tax on the materials paid at the front end. If he has the paint already in his inventory, he can pay it on his 315 line. The cost of the materials, the tax he has to pay on the cost of the materials plus any markup can be shown to the taxpayer, but he doesn't separately line item the tax. No tax on the job, okay? Replacement. Mm. Replacement is a little bit harder for a painter. They don't really do that very often. However, um, you might have somebody who has to come in and replace a whole entire like section of your wall. Maybe you had um, maybe you had tile on your wall and they pulled it off and it caused holes and stuff and you just want to have it all redone. It's part of a replacement job. So same rules for maintenance and repair, same stuff tax on the materials. Alteration's a little bit different. Um, your painter won't necessarily have alteration on his own, but he might be involved in an alteration project that a prime is doing. And so it'll be an existing home or a building. And so, you know, the painter knows that building has been there forever, not a new construction, so it's not obvious. Um, <clears throat> he's going to have to rely on the prime that hires him to tell him if it's alteration that stays with a MURA. In other words, it's less than 25% of the full assessed cash value of a residential property or for a commercial property, the contract totals at the beginning less than $750,000, impacts less than 40% of the square footage, or is an expansion of less than 10% of the envelope of the existing square footage. And the prime will make that uh, determination for him. Additionally, the prime can tell him even if it's a, a modification or a MURA, uh, regardless where on the MURA he should pay tax on the materials, a prime can tell him by giving a Form 5005, don't pay tax on your materials when you purchase them. I want you to invoice me 
and tell me no tax was paid and then I'll pay the tax on my own return. Sometimes they'll do that because uh, they want to be able to show they paid the tax themselves. The law says if a prime contractor can demonstrate that the tax was paid on all the materials, if they're audited, they can then apply that tax they paid on the materials to the balance they owe if we determine it wasn't a MURA. So it defrays the amount of their tax penalty and interest. The Form 5005 was modified a few months ago to uh, indicate that it uh, is an exemption for the tax for prime contracting. So in other words, that tax on 65%. Additionally, it exempts a sub from paying tax on the retail equivalent for the materials. When that invoicing happens between a prime and a sub, uh, the sub invoices the prime and says one of two things, depending on what the prime said to them. First thing, total job was $10,000. The material cost, and this is the prime's material cost, not the subs, material cost was $2,000. And if the prime said to pay the tax, which includes tax paid, or if the prime said don't pay the tax, job was $10,000. The material cost was $2,000 on which no tax was paid. They don't have to say the dollar amount of the tax or anything, just whether or not it was paid, and that's all we're looking for if we were to come and talk to the prime. Okay? Would you say that it would be okay for a painting contractor to breach the MERA policy? Yes. Uh, if a painting contractor, any contractor doing anything, a guy that carpets, a guy that roofs, a guy that does air conditioning repair, uh, a guy that does pool repair, a guy that comes in and only repairs landscaping and sprinkler heads, all of those guys, if they restrict themselves to only working on existing stuff and never working on anything that is modification, they then pay the tax on all their materials. These are the guys that could totally get rid of their tax license. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Under the, under the contract license rules. They do not any longer have a requirement since February 24th of 2015 any link between having a tax license and a prime contracting license. That's gone. Additionally, uh, if there's somebody who would have to pull a building permit, but they only do MURA stuff, depending on the permitting process for each city, uh, some MURA jobs might still need a permit. Uh, if they have to get a permit, they no longer, if it's a MURA, true MURA, and they're a true MURA person, they don't have to show a tax license to get the permit either. They do have to still have a city business license. And that's separate in many cities from the tax license. It's a um, permission to be doing any business within the city. And every business that operates for the public has to have it, whether they're a taxable business or not. Like an accountant may have to have a professional licensing for a city. In Tucson, that's the case. Or an attorney or a doctor's office. Heck, I work for the Department of Revenue, and in one of our outlying offices, the one in Chandler, we had to have a Chandler business <laughs> license because that's what the rules said. And not only that, the fireman, which is not a problem because that was kind of neat, firemen drove up a truck, and the firemen came in and during their fire inspection, checked to make sure we had a valid license. It was kind of funny, but true, we don't charge tax, we collect it. You wouldn't think about that, but you have to follow the same rules, okay? All right. Yes, sir. Uh, just a couple of dumb questions, probably. No dumb questions. If we're doing a remodel and say we have the painter come in to do that, that wall, uh, we have told him we're going to take care of the tax, mm -hmm. then do we need to have him keep his material and labor separate? He, he doesn't have to necessarily. He, <coughs> he needs to tell you the dollar amount of the material that is your cost of the material. That can include, if you told him not to pay tax on it, you have to give him a form 5005. And so he'll have to tell you what your cost for the material is, which is his cost plus whatever markup. Right. Yeah. So then we don't report his labor in our total then as we figure our sales tax? You would figure what your total payment for the job is, the gross receipts. And that would include his labor? It includes... Everything. It doesn't matter, his labor. It includes everything you get paid for. It's gross receipts, not pieces of your job. It never has been pieces of your job. Mm -hmm. In Arizona, tax is based on your gross receipts. So if the client pays you $80,000 to do whatever you're doing, your gross receipts are $80,000. Right. If it's a MURA job, it's all considered exempt from tax, 
and you take it out with deduction code 500. If it's not, then your deductions are the tax factored and collected, uh, and you also get to take a 35% standard deduction. All right. Okay? All right. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So, going forward, there's been a little bit of a change. Well, we're just serving that. Right? Let me go okay. to this, go and then we'll come back go to ahead. that. Yep, I'll come right back to you okay, that's fine. since I already started. Um, every business license with the Department of Revenue is required to renew their license now every year. It wasn't that way in 2010 when you were with us, but if you kept your state license up, you got a renewal notice last year, and it told you your new license would be good for one year, and sure enough, here we are a year later, you got your renewal license information, and uh, again, it's telling you your license is good for one year. After the first of the year, you'll get a new license, and uh, it'll again be good till the end of 2016. The state does not have license fees. Most program cities do not have license fees for renewal currently. Legislation has made it so that they needed to speak now or forever hold their peace a while ago. Uh, so until legislation changes, license fees are staying pretty much where they are. No changes, no increases, nothing like that right now. Um, your tax license, good for only one year. So there's been a change in the exemption certificates as well. Last year we kind of let it all fly. Um, and no big changes because we had enough changes. Now, I want you to notice on the Form 5000s, and you will get this probably from your retailers that you're buying from your suppliers, they might tell you now every year you need to give them a new 5000 or 5000A if you're a retailer, um, those kinds of certificates because now when you read the certificates, it says it is good for no longer than 12 months, okay? So that way, even though in the past you could say it was good for a million years, now we're saying we're keeping it to about 12 months, and it can be the calendar months, a rolling calendar, but that next year they're going to have to ask you and check and make sure your, their license is still good. For businesses that accept exemption certificates, retailers, on our website, aztaxes.gov, there's a place where you can check to make sure the licenses are valid. It says license verification. You type in the license number, you hit search. It will tell you if it's a valid license or not, and you can actually print that page and attach it to the exemption form that you have so that if we ever come through to audit, you can go, not only that, I did my due diligence and checked and made sure the license was valid. Okay? All right. Yes, sir? Okay. We have a contractor who buys materials for a Murrah job. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden this job falls through. He doesn't use Now he uses these materials in a taxable modification activity. So he should not have paid tax. Obviously, he has paid tax. Is that just a deduction on the TPT one? No. What's no. the procedure for that? The procedure is you shouldn't have paid tax at the front, and just as always, if you pay tax where you shouldn't, you go back to the person you bought from. Yep. Yeah. That's uh, that's why the nimbleness in the law comes on the side of don't pay when you purchase. Right. Don't pay, period. Yeah, and then sort it out at your end using the 315. Uh, you know, what works for you isn't going to work for her, isn't going to work for him necessarily. It right. depends on how you handle right. your inventory. People who have a lot of little pieces buy in bulk. You know, it's really hard to buy five wire nuts for this job. You get a thousand of them. So you do the tax based on I paid this much for a thousand, I used five. That means that cost me this, the tax. And that's why that 315 line is there. The other thing is, it makes it better for you to spread it out. You know, let's say you buy all your inventory at the beginning of the year because you get a good price. Then you only have to pay tax on it when you incorporate it into the job. That also works pretty well for contractors because sometimes you don't get paid until the job is complete. So the burden of paying the tax spreads out as you get those progress payments instead of all at the front when you buy all your stuff. Okay? So That's what I Yeah, that's the answer. The yeah, there's no magic wand. Now the good part is, um, and I've had a lot of contractors say, oh, that means we have to keep inventory. Ah. Well, yeah. <coughs> and it's a little scary you weren't right along. Like, haven't you ever maybe had something and thought, gee, I've got it, I don't need to buy more for this, and then when you look, it's gone, and you wonder, gee, where did all my stuff go? 
that would be, you know, and here's the other thing, every other business in Arizona, like a restaurant that purchases exempt from tax, they have to keep track of what they use. And a retailer who purchases exempt from tax, he has to keep track of what he uses. That's why that 030 exists. So it just kind of puts you all in the same boat. Yeah, okay, so. For 2016, the Department of Revenue is going to automatically mail you your new license to the same address we mailed your renewal letter to unless you tell us, don't do it. If you tell us, don't do it, and you can do that by doing the business account update form, which is kind of part of the process of the renewal, and say, hey, don't do it, we will not send you a new license. If you forget, and that happens, like you get the update form and you're busy, you read it, you put it in an envelope because you're like, I'll read it later, and you don't read it. And then you get your new license and you're like, darn it, I meant to cancel that thing. Not a problem. You can still use the business account update form to cancel your license. You can also use the business account update form to update things. Like let's say that went to an address for you, but you now have a physical location that is your physical location address. You were using your house and now you have a storefront or something. You can use the business account update function to update any of that kind of information at any time. It's always on our website. Let me tell you something cool that's coming this year. I am blown away by this. Uh, I, I am, I really am. This is something like I love things to be simple for you guys and this just blows my hair back. We have aztaxes.gov as a conduit for you guys to use to file your returns, make payments, stuff like that. If you're registered to use AZ Taxes, Doing simple updates like mailing addresses or physical location addresses and stuff like that is going to be as easy as doing it through AZ Taxes starting sometime during this year. The business account update function is being moved to AZ Taxes. Additionally, sometime this year, you'll be able to pay license fees using AZ Taxes too, which is something you couldn't do in the past. In fact, I'm right now writing a tutorial for how to get a business license, and your business license can be put through on easy taxes, no signature card, you actually generate an e-signature that you'll use, and you can pay the license fee, and if there's nothing slowing it down in the process, it will, within 24 hours, show on easy taxes for you to file and report under, and then you'll get your license in the mail. Is that cool? That's like, holy cow, we're in this century with the rest of business. That's, that is, Government moving at the speed of business right there. Banks can do it. Now we're able to. It'll be really cool. Um, the tutorial I'm writing should be out there pretty soon. There's a bunch of tutorials already. But it'll be out there pretty soon as soon as that functionality is there for you. Sorry, I didn't take care of something. Hopefully I didn't mess up your slide. No, we're in the right place. Okay. So if you didn't get your uh, renewal form, you can call our customer service number. I'm going to give you a better number. Um, there's one at the end of that handout, but I want you to have a better number. In order to provide better service to everybody, um, our phone lines have been a nightmare for years for people to get through. And it's because we had one phone line, like separate thinking here, separated thinking, one for income tax problems and one for business tax problems. And at certain times of the year, the business tax one would get really busy and then people would dial the other number and clog that one up. Just like anything, if you want to get more flow, you put a bigger pipe, right? Okay, so we have a bigger pipe coming through now. The phone number that you'll use uh, is 602-255-3381. It is what the old income line number used to be. It's going to have a gating uh, in it for you to choose that it's for business tax and you push that button. And then everybody that answers the phone is more cross-trained so that instead of having one group of people that has to actually have call volume switched to them when this over here is really busy, it'll ring out to everyone. They'll have some people who are more experts at some things. You may have to get an expert that gets on the line with you or get transferred to somebody who's an expert or higher up but we'll have more people answering the phones and try to get the phone situation um, a lot easier to get through, okay? It's coming. So. And you said that phone number was for business renewal. It's for everything. Oh, for everything, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, 
we're moving to one phone number and then it'll ask you questions it's like when you call a bank i know i hate listening to those things press one four blah 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 but it does it is actually a quicker system to get you in get you queued and then send the calls to where it needs to go it our old system was old i mean like old 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 and so they updated it to a new system in fact the old telephone system was like so old that the company that built it didn't even support it anymore and so it was time for us to get an upgrade and so they upgraded and when they did it's got this much better functionality so it's working pretty cool if you need a new uh, tax license for some reason or you have somebody who needs a license um, the joint tax application is going to include Sedona as of the first of the year. The tax application is being uh, kind of revived to make it easier to flow through. Um, there's also going to be a smaller application out there for city-only items like advertising and residential rental for the cities that have that or businesses that have no employees. So they don't have to deal with all that withholding and unemployment stuff. When you go through AZ Taxes to get a tax license, First, you register as a registered user. Then you uh, can do your tax license. It asks you up front what you want, and if what you want isn't withholding or you want a city-only license, it doesn't ask you those other questions. It just gates you through as quick as possible to kind of streamline your process as well. Okay. So you're saying we don't have to do this with Sedona. It's automatically going to be. Sedona, everybody who already has a state tax license, Sedona will be added. Yep. We've been uh, working on a matching and merging everything together process. We did it for the first time with the uh, three other cities that came on board last year. It works pretty good. Your business license is uh, your right to transact any kind in your city. Interesting, since she asked, I'll just say, some cities didn't have a business license. They used their tax license for that. And in fact, one city, city of Tucson, didn't have a tax license. They collected tax using their business license. They now are getting everything kind of straightened out to be more uniform too. Okay. The business account update form, you can do it by paper if you want to, or starting in 2016, here in the next month or two, you'll be able to do business account update stuff on AZ Taxes if you're registered to use AZ Taxes. Kind of neat. I don't know if you're like me. Um, I don't always have stamps. And they always ask you that question at the grocery store, stamps or ice? And I forget and say no, and then I'm like Homer Simpson, Doom! I needed stamps. So this coming online thing is kind of a good thing. And that's just if you want to change addresses. Or... If you have to change addresses, uh, you've changed the way that your name reads, things like that. Want to request a filing frequency change? You can do that on there too. This is what the TPT-1 looks like if it's a paper form you choose to file. Recent legislation made it that if you have more than one physical location, like you're a retailer with two stores, you or a restaurant or anything that has more than two locations, physical locations, you're supposed to file electronically anyway. Our easy taxes process follows the TPT-1 pretty closely in the way that it flows and the way that it works and generates the information to us, it asks you questions and it gives you choices, okay? So that's kind of important. One of the things that has changed for um, folks, and you might have noticed this on your regular state return, you have to use the Schedule A and the deductions correctly. I answer this question every day. I got something that says I owe more tax. I shouldn't owe more tax. They took away all my deductions. Why? And my answer is, you probably are reporting under the wrong business class or taking deductions under the wrong business class. Or I had one person who said, it looks stupid if I write my deductions on there because the total looks like twice what it should be. So I just write on there the county lines and then I write under it, same for the city those actual words same for the city <laughs> what could be wrong <laughs> and the answer is you need to put the deductions where you take the deductions so this is new and different um, we didn't used to make people have to 
put their deductions in there, but you know, it, it's a tax return and it has to balance. At our end, we have to make it balance. We've been doing it in the background forever. Now we are having people do it at the front end for us. And so. this is if you do it behind the scenes. If you do it online. If you do it online, you have no choice. However, I had a lady call me yesterday who said, I'm trying to do it online and it's not giving me the deductions I should have. And I said, what do you do? And she told me what she did. And then she said, those deduction codes aren't showing up. And I said, that's because you're really a retailer. I'm not sure why selling telephones has you, why you ever said that you're a 003 business code. She's a retailer. She sells phones. So she was trying to take the sale for resale and all those other deductions that you can take when you're a retailer and none of them show up under her 003 business code because she's not a 003. What's 003? Telecommunications. Yeah. I was like, holy, holy cannolis, lady. You're in the wrong, shooting in the wrong hole. It's very complicated. Well, we're trying to make it easier. We well, it's are. It's like that 29 and 30. Yep. Yep. She says there's some place you could read about it. I'm going to tell you. Um, on our website, there are some great resources. One of the greatest resources we have is pub it's a, a tab that says publications. If you click on it, there is a publication for almost every single business classification that there is. There are some that are not uh, listed separately, like mining and severance uh, isn't. It doesn't have its own little piece, but it's in the uh, other taxes one. There's one that says other, other special taxes, and it's in there. Um, we have a taxpayer bill of rights out there for businesses. We have what to expect under audit. For accountants, we actually have an audit tab on our web page, and if you choose <coughs> transaction privilege tax audit, the whole entire transaction privilege tax audit manual is printable and readable. Kind of handy. It's the playbook for how we're going to look at returns and what information we're going to look at. So and this is on aztaxes.gov? Az, uh, AZDOR.gov. AZTaxes is where you file. AZDOR is like our main web page. So is there, like, if you're starting a business, is there a basics? How funny how you ask that. There's one that is actually called Business Basics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. It is. It tells you about what you need licensing for. That one uh, you can actually find if you click on businesses. Um, you can find it under the very heading that talks about licensing. And it's a link that says business basics. Yep. Yep, it's there. Additionally, on our website, there's a thing that says legal research, which sounds scary. Mm -hmm. However, it's uh, every written ruling that we have, every private taxpayer ruling, every tax procedure, also a pretty good wealth of knowledge. Sometimes if somebody asks me a sticky question, I'll go, let me see if I can find, I remember a ruling we had on that, and I'll go look until I find the ruling, I'll read what the ruling was elsewhere and what our procedure is and stuff. It's nice to break them down into like corporate and TPP. It and does. Yeah. He brings up, it breaks it down by tax type, which it does, and then for the uh, rulings, if you do TPT, it breaks it down by business classification. <coughs> so the ones that are for amusement, say they're for amusement. The ones that are for retail. So you can kind of pick what you need. Kind of handy. This is uh, the tax rate table. I used to love when you guys were with us originally in Sedona because you were one of my examples. You're a city that happens to be in two separate counties depending on what area you're in. There's a couple others. Winkleman is one. Um, Queen Creek is another. <laughs> so Sedona is one. Um, which brings me to, you need to pick the right county. They're listed across the top for the address you're in. Now, that can be a little dicey for contractors. I mean, old hats that have been here forever and ever probably know what part of the place you're in, if you're in Yavapai or Coconino. But you might not know if you're within the city limits or not. Because sometimes cities take on more land. Um, they annex parts. Their city boundaries change sometimes. We have a resource on our aztaxes.gov under resources called the AZ Tax Rate Lookup Tool. You type in the address. 
you click search, put the address in like as if the post office was doing it. No periods, no capitals, no nothing. You click search, it will tell you if that address is viable, like not a brand new house or something. It'll come up and it'll say where that is located. It'll tell you the region, in other words, what county. It'll tell you what city, if it's in the city limits, and it'll refer you to a separate city, like if it's Flagstaff, one of those ones that collects their own right now, it'll say here's a link to their page. Um, otherwise, if it's one that we collect the tax for, which Sedona will be, um, it'll have a drop down, down at the bottom and it asks you to pick the type of business you're in and then when you click it, it will tell you what your tax rates are. Makes it much easier for contractors out and about. Also, if you're somebody who is a retailer who goes to mobile venues to sell, like out to a swap meet or to a fair or whatever, it'll help those people be able to figure out what their tax rates are too so they get it right. Okay? Kind of handy. Uh, it's on aztaxes.gov. On the right-hand side of the page, uh, there's like a center piece, and it's got uh, like a, two sets of columns. On the right is resources. Okay. The very last link, aztaxes rate lookup tool. You're welcome. You have a separate little handout for City of Sedona right now. But I'm going to say... Um, our rate tables are published on our website every month. I would encourage you, and I had a lady just say this to me the other day, well, I have a rate table I printed out at the beginning of the year, and now my tax return says a different rate. What happened? And the answer is, sometimes there are changes. The state rate stays pretty static. It doesn't change unless there's like a vote that changes it and adds a 1% or something like that happens. But cities have the ability to change their tax rates by city ordinance at a schedule that they determine. Which means you might have a mid-year change. It usually doesn't occur mid-month. We did have one once. Remember, I've been there 22 years. One time once, I remember one that changed on the 30th of a month, but it was a 31-day month. Doesn't happen often, that was a oops. But um, it might change. And so what I would encourage you to do is get in the habit of going out and looking, hey, here's my county, here's my city, nope, nothing's changed, and just roll on from there. But you should get in the habit of looking every month. It's easy to see. On our front page, under news, it'll say the, and right now it says, the December rate tables are available. Here in another week or so, it'll say the January rate tables are available. And just take a peek. Your county rate is always going to be county rate is always going to be in the table one. In table two, alphabetically, are listed all the cities, and this is how Sedona will be. It'll be in there by Sierra Vista and Summerton and all those in the S's. And yours will list out showing your city and the county you're in, because sometimes people don't know the county. Yours will say C O C and Y A V with a slash. And then it'll list out all your city business codes. Okay? And again, if you do it online, those tax rates are going to be updated. Correct. Yep. We, we update and test to make sure the right rates are in there um, every time there's a rate change. The cities have to notify us before the rate change happens. Right. And one thing I always will say, I had a friend who paid her taxes online. Mm -hmm. Well, you generally cannot pay unless you have a liability. I don't know how she did it. But My guess is she sent in her return and generated a liability and then paid her liability after the fact. Yeah. Not a, a good idea. Yeah. Best to file. One of the cool things about filing using AZ taxes, not that I'm <coughs> selling AZ taxes, but she brought it up. One of the cool things about it is um, you file and then your return is electronically sent into your inbox, like a copy of your return to print out, and it says right across it, electronically filed. And so you have it, and you can store it electronically, automatically on your computer, which is kind of neat. If you do a paper return, you have to scan it in order to electronically save it, or you have to keep the paper.
keeping paper is okay, but then you end up with boxes of paper and boxes of paper and boxes of paper and boxes of paper. And I don't know if you're like me, but um, I don't have a spare day to go through and throw out the ones that are 10 years old or seven years old. Like the other day I was doing something at my house and I came across my 1987 income tax return for Arizona. Pretty sure that's out of date. I could have purged that years ago. So this makes it easier to keep the electronic files for you. Yeah, if you crash, I would always say back it up. I back up everything. Yes, ma'am. Just out of curiosity, in the 06 change that speculative builder, exactly what is that? Ah, her question is, what is a speculative builder? A speculative builder is somebody who's building a house that doesn't really have a customer. Oh, okay. The state doesn't Fair separate enough. that out. We just call it prime contracting. Okay. Some cities treat it slightly differently. The state does not. Okay. Yeah. Some of these rates are exactly Because the city, her question is, oh, since all these r rates are mostly the same, why do we have to have the separate business classes? And the answer is because your city can choose to raise the rate for whatever the heck they want to. Or they can add in an additional tax. So if we don't have a separate for the business code, that makes it difficult because then those people in that classification then need to learn a separate business code. So keeping it all uniform makes it easier if your city decides suddenly, hey, publication is going to be 1% higher, they can do that. Also, um, sometimes you'll see a city add what's called an additional tax. And an additional tax, you have one for hotels and motels. So that additional tax only is uh, going to somebody who reports under 044 for your city. They wouldn't know what they have revenue That's and stuff. What I wondered, yeah, there was else some of it is there. that, and some of it is that they can adjust their rates. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you'll notice that some rates are higher and some rates rates are lower. Um, you don't have as much of it as some, but for instance, in Casa Grande, Casa Grande's retail rate is higher by one percent. And the reason their retail rate is higher is because they have a mall. For you guys, hotel motel is a little bit higher and it has an additional tax. That's because you're a tourist center. Your city will elect to tax what will be the least burden on its people, number one, because you live here and you vote, and number two, what's gonna get them money to run the city and what costs them money, Got it. you know? Yeah. yeah, so it's like part of that whole commerce and one of the ways that your city keeps track is, oh, so look at this. All of a sudden, we have a lot of prime contracting going on. Maybe we should look at why we have so much prime contracting being reported. Are we having a housing boom? Does that mean that we need more licensing people? Do we need more fire department people, more police? That is the economic research part of it. But the other part is, oh, and hey, this is costing us more money now to maintain. Maybe we need to look at the rate. Okay? Arizona tax is complex. Tax everywhere is complex. Yeah. All right. Resources. <coughs> you have a lot of resources available to you. Um, the phone number there for taxpayer information and assistance, go ahead and change that to that 3381 number. It's uh, on my slide. Oh, wait, it's on contacting. I'm sorry. Resources. Um, you can sign up for emails and text messages to come to you. The Department of Revenue now has a new thing that we're doing. Um, you can go to azdor.gov or aztaxes, and there's a little, um, the first time you go there, you'll have a pop-up that comes up if your pop-up blocker lets it come through and it goes, would you like to receive updates in the mail from this entity? And if you sign up for it, it then says, what do you want to know about? And you can check as many boxes as you want. And then every time we update our website, which means like the new rate table, or a new tax ruling or whatever that pertains to what you want to know, you'll get it in your inbox with a link back to the website that shows you where you can find it, which is kind of cool. Um, so you can do it that way. Or if your pop-up blocker blocks it, on the far right-hand side, there's a word that says contact us, and right under it, it says, do you want to get updates? And it looks like a, a letter, like a mail, you know, that you're sending an envelope. 
with a little call out button that's an angle on the bottom of it. You click on that, it'll come up with the overlay and you can sign up to get updates. I signed up to get all our updates just because I want to see the amount of them we get. It's not overwhelming if it's all. Meh, I get like one or two every day or so. Additionally, we're on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. We're easy to find. Arizona Department of Revenue, you put that in, we come right up. Um, we put every important update that we have on social media as well. You guys are on your mobile phones. You're not standing in front of your mailbox pulling out your mail. You've got a mobile phone. That's how you operate. So us getting information to you, how you'll be able to pick it up, is important to us. So if you're somebody who has a Facebook and you have it pop up messages on there and you follow us, the messages will pop up on your phone. If you have Twitter and you want to follow us, Twitter. If you're a LinkedIner, follow us on LinkedIn. Everything that goes on social media will also go out in those texts and emails that come to your box. Okay, so one way or another, we're going to get the information to you. That's the first part. So sign up, get information. It's one of your resources. On our azdor.gov website, I gave you links there under business transaction privilege tax. That's where you'll find the rate tables. That's where you'll find information. Right below that, there's one for forms. If you need forms, you click on forms, it opens a pane in the center, and you can select what tax type you need forms for. For transaction privilege tax, everything is there, starting with the joint tax application and going all the way through all the exemption forms. Now I mentioned there's a new form 5005 for contractors that identifies both the contracting TPT as well as the retail equivalent as being something that a prime can tell a sub they don't have to worry about in their gross receipts. Okay. There's also a new Form 5000 for retailers. There's a new Form 5000. The new Form 5000 not only reflects that it's only good for 12 months now, but sale for resale has been moved off it. That now you can only purchase sale for resale using a Form 5000A, not the Form 5000. So the resale certificate, 5000. All the 5000 series are pretty much good for one year. Uh, there is a new form for doing work for healthcare organizations or a healthcare organization purchasing. The new forms now in the instructions tell you exactly what you need in order to use them. And pretty much all of them are good for 12 months. Okay? I'm just going to um, clarify. Uh, I'm a subcontractor working for a prime, so I would request the 5005 from the prime instead of my 5000. Well, you should have never gotten a 5000 ever from a prime. From a prime. Never. Always 5005. Yes. If you're doing the installation, and I asked you at the beginning, cash and carry or not, and you said, no, we're installing. Anytime it's being installed in a structure, you should have gotten a 5005, okay. always. Okay? Still a 5005. Now, uh, the only change is it not only exempts you from tax on 65% of your gross receipts that he pays you, but if it's a Murrah job, he can also say, and I don't want you paying tax on the material. I want you to tell me to pay tax on my cost for the material. Okay? Okay. And did you say that 5005 we should give to the subs yearly? Uh, well, his question is, should I give it to them yearly? And my answer is, eh, it's up to you. Um, it has always had the option that you can uh, make it be for a period from and through. It can't run more than a year, but you could have it for a year. You could also restrict it to a certain job. Like, I only want him to have it for this job. Why would you want to do that? And my answer is, if he's working for you often and there is going to be some time that you may want him to pay tax on his materials, you probably wouldn't want him to have one that overlaps forever and says don't pay tax on the materials either. Mm -hmm. Right? So if they're only good for a year, then we really should give them one every year. Or less. Give them one every job. Whatever works for you. Again, we try to provide as much nimbleness, nimbleness in the forms so that it suits you and you and you and you. If this prime and sub only ever work together and they only ever do the same kind of jobs, make it a year. 
If you have a variety of different things and you're going to use them for a variety of different things, you might want to fine tune it a little bit. Yeah. It yep. actually gives us a lot of paperwork. We have a lot of subs. Well, but so. do you have a lot of subs that uh, tr that do different types of things for you, or do you have some that you use for the same thing over and over? That sub does the same thing in his trade over and over and over. Then he could have it for a whole year. Yeah. 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 All right, thanks. Yeah. I mean, again, it depends on the prime and sub relationship, but for you, if, it, if you're doing the same types of jobs and you're hiring the same subs and it looks like you're a home builder, so pretty much your tax is going to be on the total home. You would be safe in telling him, here it is for the whole year, Mr. Roofer, and you'd be good. And I've got a similar question. Like for a new addition on an existing home, you're not doing anything to the existing home pretty much other than you are doing a new addition. Uh, would that be considered like new construction? The prime would take care of all of that if he wanted to? Well, here's what I'm going to answer you with regard to, to an addition. Uh, it starts under MURA. MURA is maintenance, repair, replacement, and alteration. Mm -hmm. A new addition is an alteration. It's something that affects existing structure, but it isn't a repair, it isn't a replacement, it's not maintenance, it's that something else. And so for that something else, um, what you're talking about, an addition. Or let's say it's an existing home, but it's one that was built in the 80s and it has a thousand little rooms and they want to go great room. Or expand and add a bathroom or something like that. Those kind of things. That's an alteration. And the rules for alterations say that in a, the case of a residential alteration, your full contract for what you're doing will be considered MURA, Maintenance, Repair, Replacement, and Alteration, if your total contract price is 25% or less of the full assessed cash value of the house as listed on the county assessor's website. Okay, so you go to your county assessor's website and for you guys in this area, probably good to use the home, uh, the rate lookup tool to make sure you got the right county. So you go to the Yavapai County assessor's website, you look up that address, it will tell you the full assessed cash value, which is what their tax is based on. Let's say it's a $200,000 house. So you now can have $50,000 um, as a contract and still be a MURA. If you start at $60,000, which is above, it's modification taxed at 65% of the total job. Now, let's say you're doing the same exact type of addition work, same square footage, same everything, okay? But let's say the house is assessed at $60,000. Now you're doubling the value of the house. You're more, you just go right to modification. So it's going to all depend, even if it's the same exact work, it's going to depend on what the full assessed cash value of the house is. That's a little deceptive. Um, it's updated about every year to two years. But I can tell you at one time I lived in Maricopa. And my house was assessed as farmland for the first two years I lived there, which was great because my tax was like super low. But what a surprise when they finally assessed it as, as a house. Suddenly my house payment went up a bit because part of it was paying my property tax in the, the impound of the escrow. Okay. So if it's over 25% then it goes to modification, you say then the prime takes care of it all? Well, the, then the, the prime can always elect to take care of it all. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, as I said with a Murrah, a prime can always give that 5005 and say, not only am I saying I'm in charge and I'm handling it, but I'm also saying even though it's a Murrah, I want to pay tax on all the materials myself. So we can do that even if it's under 25%. Yes, you can. We can do that. You can, and you would pay. Then, then your sub invoices you and says, my part of the job was $10,000. My material was your cost for my material is $2,000, mm -hmm. and I didn't pay any tax. And then you... Pay tax on your 315 line for $2,000. Yep. yep, you can do that. Yep. Oh, all right. If that works better for you, you bet. It's yeah. It's a little clearer that way, it seems like. It makes it easier for a lot of people um, to have that nimbleness. Now, mm -hmm. you could say, I just want them paying tax on the materials. I know it's a Murrah. I'm coming in and I'm whatever, repainting. I'm whatever. I'm refinishing and doing the floors and doing a kitchen remodel, but the footprint is staying the same. I'm just replacing the cabinets, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to have them pay tax on all their materials, and you can do that too. Whatever works for your paperwork. Yep. Right. 
one more dumb question. No dumb so, questions. So if they're if the sub is working under the Murrah, and they pay, they're paying tax for their materials when they buy it. Mm -hmm. So then, what we pay them for the for the course of the job, we don't have to report that. Am I right? Well, you still report your gross receipts for Murrah. You would take a deduction for the fact that your total job is a Murrah. Mm -hmm. The deduction code is deduction code 500. The deduction for MURA, it's still considered prime contracting, but it's tax-exempt prime contracting. Mm -hmm. It works the same as if you were a sub. You still report your gross receipts, but you take it out as exempt. Mm -hmm. So let's say your total job is to remodel a kitchen. You're not changing the footprint. You're taking out the flooring and putting in new tile. You're taking out the cabinets and putting in new cabinets. You're putting in new countertops, and you're repainting the whole thing. Okay, but everything else is staying the same. You're not changing anything. It's all replacement. So that's a MURA. All right. So every piece of that job, you could tell them to pay the tax on their materials and they invoice you and say, I paid the tax and you've got that part covered. You get paid $30,000 to do that whole MURA project. Your gross receipts are $30,000. Your deduction is $30,000. Your net taxable is zero. You personally paid no tax. The tax was paid by your people that did the work. We would come to you and go, you said it was a MURA. You'd go, yep, this is what I did. We'd go, yep, that's a MURA. Did you pay tax on your materials? And you're going to go, every one of my subs did. Here's their invoices. And on their invoices, they said that their material amount included tax. So we go, you're covered. We then could go to the subs and go, hey, you told this guy you paid tax on all your materials. Show us. And they're the ones that have to have the proof. Okay? Right. Makes it very easy to follow. Both ends, for you and for us. Okay? All right. So, we also have aztaxes.gov out there. aztaxes.gov is for filing, for paying, for looking stuff up. It has resources out there. It has NAICS codes out there. Um, for me, and, and I say for me, because I don't just work for the Department of Revenue. I actually had a business. And I used AZ Taxes to file. Now, I had a selfish reason. The reason I used AZ Taxes to file is because I can't remember anything. And so I would kind of forget and be too late to mail it. And then I'm like, oh, but I could sign on and do it. I'll do it real quick. Okay? For me, it was awesome because I then could have a record of all my returns being filed. Because when you file a return, it shows that you had a return that filed, and it shows if you had a liability or not generated from it, and you can also pay through it. And it sends that electronic copy to your email, your email in there, a secure email. You have like a message box. So it is kind of neat. I like it for that. Every liability you have, whether you filed the return online or not, will show up there. But returns that you don't file through AZ Taxes won't show up there. So if you were home and you needed a copy of your January return but you paper filed it, you would have to dig through until you found your own paper file. If you electronically filed it using AZ Taxes but you couldn't find your paper copy of it, you could just go to your computer and print out your electronic copy. How long do they keep um, Well, I'm testing that right now. I have heard that they purge periodically. Um, they let you know well in advance. I've had mine on there for two years. Mine are still there. I have a feeling when they take on all the cities, there'll probably be a purge and they'll tell you about it. But still, you save it. You make a backup on your disk. You put your disk somewhere safe. You've got an electronic on your computer, a disk backup. That's still better than having a rumply up piece of paper somewhere in your office. I would take that every time. I hate clutter and I'm allergic to dust. So... This is what I like about it. For me, um, it's kind of handy. Also on Easy Taxes, there's a where's my refund for individual income tax. Um, just an as a side, you guys are business owners, you probably don't think about it, but if you file an electronic return, you can go on the where's my refund, uh, click on it 24 hours a day. Um, it's updated three times a day, and it'll tell you where in the process your electronically filed return is. A credit sitting for income tax? Yeah, I accidentally paid the, uh, the sitting tax. It was like $22. Oh, 
on your transaction privilege tax, you have a credit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tried to get it against what I owed, and that they charged, they billed me for penalty. My guess is because it probably is showing as a license fee. There are some things that we will, um, we run a process called refunds and offsets mm -hmm. frequently. Um, pretty much every time before we run our billings. It's been on there for years. Yeah. One of the things that we don't generally refund just or offset to other stuff is a license fee. So if you sent us in something that showed up as a license fee and $22 suspiciously sounds like a $10 city fee yep. and a $12 exactly. state fee. Exactly. See, I've worked there 22 years. I know these things. I don't even have to look at the paper. <coughs> it happens. It's probably hanging there as a license fee because it goes to a separate pot and we can't offset or fool around with license fees. Yeah. So it's sitting there waiting for you to claim it. You probably should call our customer service number. What they'll do is try to reverse that back to you, and that's that 602-255-3381. Mm -hmm. yep. You bet. And it also references that easy tax rate lookup tool, which is amazing. That thing is great. I play with it. Uh, one of the things for you to know, if the address doesn't show up, um, you're not dead in the water. Sometimes new construction stuff won't show up because it's a new street and a new address and it's not on the tax rules that way yet. Uh, so if that happens, what it'll do is it'll go, well, we, we aren't finding your address. Could you, it sounds like it's in this neighborhood because you gave us the zip code. Do you want to pinpoint it on the map? And you can actually manipulate the map on there to make it small, you know, closer and closer and closer and then look for like the street like here's the street, here's the cross street, I'm gonna drop a pin right there. You click on the map, it drops the pin, and then it says, oh, is this where you think it is? If this is where you think it is, click here, we'll tell you the rate. Kinda handy, kinda handy. All right, so here's the phone number that I told you to please update. It's that 602-255. Uh, we have uh, 3381, which is good. Diane updated that, but in your handouts it might say the other old 2060. And it gives you the other number there. Collections, um, let's hope you don't have to call them, but if you do, it's that 5551. Licensing and registration, you can get to that through the direct licensing and registration number. That would be like if you are, are trying to get a bond exemption because you need to um, have a bond exemption for a, a so, like new construction that you're doing and you need to have a bond exemption because the city is not issuing your building permit for a new house you're building or something and you know the city sent it through but for some reason the city says they haven't got it yet you could call that licensing number and get right through or you can call the regular number that 3381 and it'll say to you hey guess what do you have a bonding question or licensing and it'll gate you through to that number too tax policy and research Sometimes you'll have like the weirdest thing happening on the face of the planet. Like, oh my gosh, this is such a weird convoluted transaction. I don't know how this fits in tax law. And I already asked Amy and I've already done all the legal research and I just have no idea. I'm, I'm gonna just ask an attorney. I mean like this isn't a normal number you would dial, but um, if you have one of those totally weird situations, Tax research, you can call them and speak to one of our tax analyst people and they'll be able to give you an idea. Additionally, on our website, we give an, uh, an address to write in to get written rulings. Um, if you have something, the state is never bound by our oral advice. We won't willfully mislead you, but sometimes in communication you'll say something and I won't quite understand you and then I'll answer you and I give you the answer for what I thought you said and then you take back my answer and use your filter and it's in the end it's a little miscommunication so the state is never bound by oral advice however we are bound by our written advice so if you are doing a huge project a huge something or you just plainly want a written ruling for yourself on something you can write in and you can say here's my situation I request that you give me written guidance and they will give you written guidance now here's the funky thing Later, they'll redact so that you're not identifiable, and they may put it on the website for other people in your situation. It'll say a business, and it'll have all your particulars blacked out, but it'll be there for other people to look at. I bring that up because 
as the gentleman over there pointed out, that legal research area is a wealth of information in how they've handled pre prior <coughs> things. There aren't that things that are new under the sun with regard to how things are handled. Sometimes you're in uh, a parallel business, not exactly the same, but what you do is close enough, you can apply some of the rules that are in some of those rulings. So they're interesting. All right. If you need to find us, this is where I drove from today, um, 1600 West Monroe. For you guys, it's fairly easy to get to. Um, you get on the 17, you take it down. Now, there's a couple of ideas of how to get there. My easiest way is to get off at the Washington um, and Adams exit and then take it. It'll have a through to get on Jefferson. You take Jefferson, which is one way down. Turn when you get to the state capitol, 17th Avenue, you make a left. Take 17th Avenue across the front of the state capitol, which is always pretty to look at. And then the second street you come to on your right will be um, the only one you can make a right turn on after Jefferson, because the other one is one way coming at you. You don't want to turn and go down that, but I've seen it done. Um, you'll come to our address, Monroe. You drive past our building. Our building will be on your left. Just past our building on the east side of it is a nice, newly repaved visitor parking lot. Um, newly repaved, now it's repaved. You guys don't have to deal with it. Unfortunately, when it was being paved, it was kind of a pain in the neck for people to park, so now you guys are safe if you come down there. Uh, services in that office. Um, we have full, full licensing, full cashiering. We have collections. We have audit people, um, taxpayer information and assistance. It's all, that is a full service nine story building. Um, anything you need that we do is there. Okay. So we've covered all the stuff that I had to talk to you about and I covered a lot of questions. I know I have a lot of contractors. So anybody with questions, you can keep asking me questions. If you're out of questions and you don't want to listen to other people's questions, you're free to go. You've got my contact information. You can get in touch with me. I will stay and answer questions until you guys are done asking me questions or until noon 15 when I really have to head home anyway. <laughs> All right. So who has questions? What's your first name? Amy. And how do you spell your last name? B is in boy, E N E S is in Sam, C is in cat, H is in hair, or hurry, or. All right, thanks. You betcha. Any questions on contracting or yes? Yeah, I've got a contracting question here. Um, bit of an involved question, but let's say we have a contractor hired by a utility company. Mm -hmm. And the utility company wants his contractor to come out and do a little spot on the roadway and repair a patch, put a patch in the road for them where they dug up the road. Mm -hmm. So based on all the criteria, it'd be a MURA job. However, however, under the CBPM 15-1, anything done for a city, a county, ADOT, or anything like that for improvement or subsurface to land is considered prime contracting. Not land, roadways. R roadways yeah, but it actually refers to two sections in statute that identify uh, state roads, city and municipal roads, right. and private and public right. partnership roadways. So if it's something to do with a roadway that falls under that governance, then it is a modification so text at 65%. Out, even though they're doing it for somebody else. And it wouldn't matter. It is the item that you're working on. And they can't even get a 5005 from the utility company. No. Yeah. Unless the utility company is they a contractor. Won't, yeah, they won't do it. Yeah, yeah they, I mean, that's yeah. not why they would hire yeah. another contractor. Right. Okay. Yeah. But this isn't a big loss. It's tax on 65% of the gross right, proceeds. Right. So you but include it in what you're, yeah. I yeah. thought it would be that yep. way, but mm -hmm. I just wanted some yeah. Now, not all roads, and when you said it's a utility company and blah, 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 it's, a, it's one of the roads that fall under that. I had another situation a lady asked me about. Um, it's a utility company in as much as that it is communications, and they uh, rent a mountaintop. You laugh, because I told you people ask me crazy questions. 
They rent a mountaintop with a bunch of other communication companies that rent this mountaintop, and they have the poles and the re towers. But they have a private road, <laughs> and the private road goes from where the highway is, and it's gated. No one else can drive on it. You have to be one of these... Um, these utilities that rent this mountaintop together, they're like a, um, kind of like a condo for poles. And they hired somebody to come out and just repave it. It's a private roadway. Right. It's not governed by those things. It would be looked at differently. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, <laughs> that's a little different. But my, you know, my statement is if it's one of those ones governed by what's shown, it has right. to be treated. Right, and it does say in that part of the statute, exclusive of subsection O, which is the one that identifies MURA. So what it's saying is, it doesn't matter if what you're doing would be right, a MURA right. if you're right. this piece of property. Right. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's on page 43 in there. <laughs> Not that I've had. <laughs> I do. I've had to look it up a bunch. It's like a section, a page. It's Title 34, uh, chapters 19 and 20, I think, and there's another chapter in there. It has to do with those roadways. If you take questions after class, I think you can send them right. Any question. Another yeah. One. No, any question. You guys are free to ask me anything at all, and I'll answer. Yes. Do you have any sort of timeline on when they're going to have electronic filing available for tax returns besides in Oh, gosh. It, you mean besides TPT and withholding? So basically, you're streamlining, streamlining it to other entities, like corporate and blah, blah, blah. My answer is, mm, yeah, yeah, probably not soon. Here's why. No software provider really necessarily cares about those for whatever reason. And secondly, the population of that is so vast and the number of different schedules and different things for those that file unified or um, with subsidiaries in a unified return, et cetera, it's just cumbersome. There is absolutely no software development company. Every state handles that at this point in time except for Arizona. We're the only one in 50 states that doesn't have corporate electronic filing. Pinocchio, no, no, no. <laughs> That no, is. I'm not saying you're not the only one. Did he not say the only one? I said one of the only one. Very few. There are very few, very unfortunately, few because of the way it is. Right. He said, but he did say the only one. It's a pain. We've got to run off the paper. I know. It is. You know what's a bigger pain on our end? Is on the very last day, the very last minute, at 4.58 p.m., we close at 5, the attorneys and accountants that bring in the, and I'm not exaggerating at all, the paper boxes, the ones that the reams of paper are in, with a unified corporate return due by 5 p.m. that day, and we have to date stamp every page of it. So we're as on board, you laugh, but remember I told you I've worked in cashiering, they, and it's like seriously, they come in like clockwork. It's like a little armada, and they're all carrying boxes, and you're like, oh, heck. We actually get out extra date stamps for that day. So we would love that as well. well I'm sure you would. We would. Unfortunately, because of the nature of it and all the stuff that goes with it, we don't have a lot of companies looking to want to do that with us. We wish. You know, it was kind of tricky to find people who wanted to do the bulk filing for TPT to test with us to do that, too. By the way, bulk filing for TPT is coming where uh, an attorney, an accountant, a CPA, a bookkeeper would be able to zoom through a bunch of different people's returns by having them in a flat file format that we specify and sending it through. Um, a lot like the bulk filing for withholding tax that's done by payroll management companies. TPT is coming on board this year with that as well. But finding a company to develop the software to do that was really tricky and we aren't necessarily software writers or marketers for that. So, But that's coming. So we keep hoping for corporate sometime. I actually opened a speech I did uh, last week I stood up and I said, the big news for corporate income tax and electronic filing this year, we aren't doing it again. <laughs> so I knew where you were going and I feel the pain. Okay, other questions? I have another dumb question. No dumb questions. Uh -huh. He's asked a bunch of them and I haven't had a, one that was dumb yet. Well, uh, the Murrah thing is just, just it, it, 
muddies up the water a little bit for us, but I'll get on to it. But I have a question like, if we've got a small job, say it's less than 25% of the assessed value, mm -hmm. uh, the prime has the right to, to go ahead and give his subs the, the 5,005 and we could take care of it all. Yes. That seems to really simplify it. It does. But if we run into subs like, like the painting contractor has told us that uh, his supplier tells him they are charging sales tax. Hmm. That's it. So this should go around that. If we give them the 5,005, they can turn that in and, and we would take care of it all then. Well, you know, here's the deal with a supplier. It goes two ways. Suppliers are retailers. They should stay in their retail realm. Their retail realm is, as a retailer, if they get a valid exemption form that says you don't have to charge tax, and they check to make sure the form is filled out correctly, the same as for the last 33 years, their liability ends there. I'm not sure why some of these suppliers have gotten very nervous or think they need to know contractors' business. They're retailers. They need to know retail business. Retail business is, I have an exemption form. It's valid. I've checked and made sure the license is correct. I've made sure that everything is filled in correctly and it's signed. And it says in the certification part of that, if I've done my due diligence and I accept it in good faith as a retailer, I am exempted from the responsibility for the tax at retail. And that shifts to the purchaser. The purchaser is responsible if they're misusing that material. So why a retailer would say that, I don't know. My answer is if somebody is not cooperating, it's a free marketplace. I'm not saying don't use them. I'm saying if they're being a pain and hard to work with, that might be something you think about. Um, it, for some reason, suddenly made a lot of retailers very nervous. Oh, but they shouldn't be. This makes it easier for them. They are no more responsible for the tax on the materials now than they were for the last 32 years before January 1st when Mr. Painter went in and bought 25 gallons of flat white and repainted his house and his mom's house. That should have been taxed then. It should be taxed now. There's no difference. Okay, so, one, one more question. If we definitely have a job that's less than 25%, it's a Murrah job, okay? And when we file our costs for that, do we file that under the 315 business code? It's not your costs. You never on TPT file your costs. Or gross. Your gross receipts right. that you get paid. That's your income. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, right. So the gross receipts that you receive from your client for right. contracting work still go on the 015 contracting line. And the deduction for MURA is deduction code 500. So let's say you get paid $30,000 to do a job. <coughs> 30000 goes in. 30000 comes out under deductions. And on the Schedule A, you would say deduction code 500 for the regions it occurred in because it's exempt. It's exempt prime contracting income. Now for the materials. Mm -hmm. If you have materials that no tax was paid on, the tax gets paid in the period that you used the materials. Okay, so whatever period you did the job in, regardless of when you get paid, your 315 line reflects the cost of materials used in a MURA on which no tax was paid. Okay? All right, thanks. So it could be on the same return and it could be on separate period returns. And the example I gave is here we are mid December. I'm doing a job now. I'll probably finish the job next week. I'm then going to invoice to get paid. I used the material in December. I might have bought that material back in January, but I'm using it in December and I didn't pay tax and it's a MURA. That 315 line for the cost of my material is in December. And when my client pays me, my gross receipts go on the 015 line whenever he pays me. January, February, hopefully right away. Sometimes no. Okay? All right, thanks. You bet. Any other questions? I know you have some. Don't be shy. Me? Yes. Oh, okay. We're a janitorial company, uh -huh. and so most of our income is service. Mm -hmm. But we do stock paper products for the customers, so we basically sell them. You retail them, yep. So I'm a retailer. Mm -hmm. And then my use tax, because I buy cleaning solutions and whatnot, but I don't sell to them. I use you them. should pay tax on those. That's that use tax from inventory. Where are you buying them from? Pay tax. Actually, no. Pay tax on them. Why not use tax? It's the 
same Because it's cheaper, it? but it's not. No. What's cheaper? Use tax is lower. This is not use tax. Use tax is something you purchased for your inventory intending to sell. It's not a 3% discount for you because you're in business. You need to pay retail tax on items you purchase to use. I'll give you an example. Okay, I'm just going with what my CPA set me up as, so that's why I want no, to No, no, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Let, me, let me be honest. Um, I'm old. I've been around a long time. And I was a licensed cosmetologist for a long time. I kept my license till three years ago because you never know after 22 years if DOR is going to work out or not. <laughs> so anyway, when I started out um, being a hairdresser, I was a manager of a salon. The stuff that I purchased to sell, I purchased without tax. Mm -hmm. But the shampoos that I used on the back bar and the, and the perms that I was going to use, I paid tax when I bought them. The cotton that you put around somebody's hairline when they get the perm, you pay tax on that because you're not intending to retail it. When you use an exemption certificate, the exemption you get when you're a retailer says, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's the exemption that says, I intend to resell it in the ordinary course of my business. You do not intend to resell five squirts of Windex and toilet bowl cleaner and floor wax. You're not reselling that, you should pay tax. And that use tax is not the right rate. And when you look at the use tax uh, lines, there's no county equivalent. It's just the state line from one side to the other, which already is about, well, between a half a percent and, a, you know, a one and a half percent or one and almost one, 1 1.8 percent in some of them. They go up. So uh, you're already discounted. And then if your city doesn't have use tax, you don't pay city tax either. So this could be, a, a, you know, an inappropriate amount. If you were audited, if you made the effort to pay the use tax, that's good. But they'd say you shouldn't have purchased it because you said intending to resell. So you would be assessed the difference in the two rates plus penalty and interest back to the day you bought it. So, yeah, you probably should be paying tax and, and designating to your supplier those things that you intend to have tax on because you were the consumer. Yeah, you're not taking them out of your inventory to use. For some reason, I thought, and I don't know, now there's so much going on. I thought I looked at that, and it was the same. I know it's 3%, but somehow there was another portion that covered that. There's a state rate, but when you look at Table 1 on our state rate table, for 029 and 030, there's no county excise okay, tax. I'll take your word for that. Yeah. I thought I looked at that, and I yeah. wondered. Yeah, no. And some cities, I, the city of Sedona has use tax. That's good. Some cities don't. Yeah. And that would be where your 3% is, your city use tax. But the state and county rate should be 5.6 for the state plus whatever your county is. Yeah. Coconino County just added 3 tenths of a percent um, on some business classes. And then um, Yavapai County, I believe, is higher than that even. So, Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this is another one of those dumb questions. There's no I'm dumb. Trying to sort. So, for example, I have a the general contractor is mm -hmm. contacting me. Uh, the job is less than 25 percent, so it's a small job. Mm -hmm. I'm providing uh, stone labor. Uh huh. I have existing thin sets because I want a pallet. Mm hmm. And I did not pay tax because I was buying that. You could have so bought it just to have it in your inventory. It doesn't matter why you bought it. Exactly. If it's inventory, then I would be paying tax under 315030. No, you would not. You're not reselling it. So, okay. You, uh, materials, so materials on hand. Used Material on hand. For the job. Right. Is all mer mer 315. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then when I'm okay, I need obviously do a job cost. Mm -hmm. Usually I do that after the job because I, I'm estimating that, uh, okay, I'll give you an example. I'm a tile contractor, so I use a half a bag of thin set or three and a half bags of thin set. I'm estimating how much I'm gonna use in a shower or estimating how much I'm gonna use. My guys choose to use an extra bag, but I don't know it till the end of the job. So when I'm calculating, 
my materials that from a tarp to a saw blade to anything that I'm using to create this. Uh, Tarps and shop. saw blades you should pay tax on when you purchase, so that doesn't figure into this because at all. That's, shop. that's your personal that's your personal tools. Okay. So that's this is only materials that are left at the job as part of the job. As part of the job. Mm-hmm. So your thin set. thin set. Okay, well, here's the deal. I have no idea how contractors make money because somehow it seems like a crapshoot when you tell somebody how much something's going to cost. My idea is that as far as tax goes, the difference between one bag of thin set and three bags of thin set is pretty calculatable and a pretty big amount. Um, you're going to need to tell your client how much that job is going to cost. So when you do that, that's going to include the materials that you use. At the end of the job, if your guys, you told, you figured the cost on one, but your guys used three, right. do you go back to the client and say, you need to pay me more? No. Okay, well, here's the because deal. I have a proposal. I'm going I to just throw this it. out there. I feel contractors build a fair amount of cushion in their bids. Well, you're going to have to be a little bit closer on your inventory, and you're going to have to be uh, figuring it in at the point that the job is using it. Right. So let's say it's all used in the month of December. You can figure out your costs on that December return and you have all the way till the 20th of January to do it. But I'm not paid on the job till January. It doesn't matter when you're paid on the job. The tax on your materials is when you use it. Right. So okay. when, to... when you put it into service on the Murrah project in that month, you then have 20 days after the end of the month to figure out what inventory you use during that month doing jobs. Yep. Okay. Yep. It should work. I mean, your guys should probably report to you a little bit more often than, you know, every three months or so what materials are you using. Because well, how do you order and stuff? Well, I have, I have employees. I don't, I don't serve on my service or anything right. like that. And, and very small community and so my pencil needs to be very sharp in order for me to get jobs okay mm -hmm. obviously competition so I don't have a lot of cushion in my bid for extra materials because well if you can have materials that are the difference between one and three bags of stuff yeah, I mean, it's that's two-thirds of an amount more than what you need that you've built in the cost. Restaurants don't overestimate the amount of food they need by two-thirds for making no, the food they have. And a store never overestimates the amount they purchase exempt from tax right. by two-thirds in case right. they sell something. And of course, on the yeah. back of the bag of thin set, it says it covers so many Right. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be in the ballpark, but, but yeah, you'll be able to figure it out when the job is done. Right. Yeah. And that's okay. Um, let's say the job gets done and you've used the thin set in December. You have okay. all the way till January 20th when your return is due to go ahead and figure out how much goes on that 315 line. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Good. Yep. Okay. It gives you a little bit of time there. And you know, in the job, the difference in tax is going to be less than 10% of what the cost of the item was. Right? Your tax rate here is 9 point something percent if it goes on the 315 line. So let's say your thin cost cost nine dollars a bag how much does it cost a bag well it depends on where i buy it I buy okay it well this this stuff that you have the pallet of right. how much is each bag of that costing you just throw a number so, out there so thirteen dollars a bag okay thirteen dollars a bag nine percent of that is a buck thirty give or take Good. okay so your tax is going to be a dollar thirty on a bag okay. it's not it's or not that simple. right it's not that like a gigantic dollar amount like it would be on your gross receipt. This is just your material, and it's what you used in that month. It could even be work in progress, you know? And you need to kind of track your material anyway because you need to know when to reorder. Right. And right. if you're, say, independent on where I bought it, I think when you get low on that pallet, you're probably shopping for a good price too. I am. Yeah, so that'll help you have some lead time on when you're purchasing your material so you can get a better price. You sure don't want to walk out there on a, a Tuesday morning and go, holy cow, I'm out of thin set. Now I have to pay whatever price close to me 
because I need it today for a job. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we do. We, it's just if you work like a lot of places, you probably kind of earmark materials for certain jobs. I've heard people do that too. Like they're like, okay, I know I have this much on hand, material on hand, so I'm going to take that out of my inventory and move it over here and say I'm probably going to use it in this job. Okay. Yeah, I've heard people tell me they do that too. Um, tile people, carpet people, because they have like a, a thing of glue, sure. you know, right. and they know how many jobs they get out of it. Uh, roofers with roofing nails, that's another one. Like I'm like, you don't have to get up there and count. I used 184 nails. No way. And I'll tell you this right now, an auditor is not going to go up there on the roof with a ladder and go one, two, three. We're not going to do that. But we know in January you bought 10,000 roofing nails and you now have bought more roofing nails in June and you didn't pay tax on them when you bought them and you're either going to have to have taxable jobs right. showing that you paid tax on 65% of the total gross or you're going to have to be paying 315 lines so it kind of makes sense and evens out. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like uh, the difference between a full bag of thin set and you use three cups of it to finish up a job, not a big deal. You're not going to, I don't have to get that. No. Okay. No, we aren't going to come out and weigh I'm your bag. Here. Yeah, no. No, but if we see that you bought five pallets of it and you only paid tax on six bags, and now at the end of the year you have none left and you never had a taxable contracting job. Sure, it's a red flag. It is. It is. Yep. Okay. Yep. I was just yeah. so confused. Oh no. It's not it's not meant to be a penalty kind of a thing and, and it's not meant for you to have to keep separate pallets like this is only used for Mura. I paid tax on it and this pallet is only used for modification. It's not meant to be that either. Not yeah. at all. Nope. We don't we aren't going to be able to handle that, much less you. <laughs> so, no, not meant to be a penalty. Okay? Thank you. you bet. You bet. Anybody else? No? None? Going once. Going twice. Going three times. All right. That doesn't mean you can't ask me anything else. You can come up and ask me anything. If you just want to ask a one-on-one -on -one question, otherwise everybody's free to go. Thank you for the meeting. Yes. Hey, you're welcome. I will be back up here in January, and I will not be offended if I see the same faces again. Additionally, if you call me on the phone, say, hey, I was just in your Sedona meeting, I'm not going to be like, I already talked to you. Why are you on my phone? <laughs> I'm like, hey, what can I help you with? The only time that I'm a little less friendly is if I, you caught me mid-chew because I eat at my desk. <laughs> And so if you catch me mid you, I might be like, Arizona Department of Revenue, this is Amy, how can I help you? You'll be able to tell because I'll be kind of mild. <coughs> so don't call at lunchtime. You cannot really figure out when my lunchtime is because, like, I, it depends on what I'm doing. Sometimes I have meetings and stuff and I eat weird times. And I get in at, like, 6.30 in the morning. So. That's probably the same with all of us in yeah. this room. Yes. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yep. Thank you for everything. You are very welcome. Yep. And you've got my contact info if things get... And you know what? Your first return is due to us in February. So if you want to come back to the January meeting and ask some more questions, then after the fact, I'm good with that. I'm always good with helping you guys out, okay? Just because I don't live here don't mean I don't care. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. It was nice meeting you. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Glad to meet you. My mic is being That's okay. Come up. Sit close to